and I'm going to be the facilitator for today's webinar. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Wiradjuri people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I am joining you from today. And I also extend that traditional um, welcome to all of the to all our elders past, present and emerging. So welcome to this second webinar as part of Riverina's Living Carbon Program. Just a few um, housekeeping matters before we get started. Just a, a reminder that the event is being reco recorded so that we can go back and watch it at later stage. Um, if you could please keep yourself on mute during the presentations and um, there'll be an opportunity at the end of the presentations for a Q&A session. So um, feel free to put any questions you may have in the chat during that time and uh, we can answer them at the end. Um, the agenda today, we've got four speakers. We have Alina Volhun, I hope I've pronounced that all right, Alina, uh, who's the Assistant Manager with the Plantings and pl Plantations section within the Clean Energy Regulator. Also joining us from the Clean Energy Regulator is Gabrielle Meeklejohn, who's their Regulatory Officer. And um, I'm sure a few of you have already been in touch with, with Gabrielle. We then have Nick Myers, who's the manager of authorizations and audits within um, primary industries. And finally, we've got our wonderful Kate Jenkins, who's the, um, the project officer for living carbon in the River Arena. So let's begin with our first speaker, who is Alina. Um, and she's going to provide um, an overview of the current uh, method within the Clean Energy Regulator and also the potential inclusions with the new method coming up. Thanks, Alina. All right. Good afternoon, all, and thank you so much for joining our presentation today. Uh, I think I'm not on the full screen yet. Here we go. So in my presentation, I'm going to cover the 2014 environmental paintings method. And also I will give this, um, uh, I will pass this to Gabby to go through uh, online services uh, project registrations. All right. So um, reforestation by environmental or mali plantings full cam, full cam method 2014 uh, is part of the Australian Carbon Credit Unit Scheme, uh, formerly known as we know Emissions Reductions Fund. So um, uh, environmental plantings projects uh, capture carbon by planting native trees and shrubs or mali species that are local to your area to establish permanent plantings to achieve forest cover and store carbon as the plants grow. Um, let's have a look um, at some, um, uh, oh, I think I'm stuck, here we go. Let's have a look at some key benefits of the environmental uh, plantings method. So under environmental paintings method, your project uh, will help you um, to restore degraded land, uh, protect your soils from wind erosion with block plantings. Also, it will help to improve water quality and soil on your property. Uh, will um, provide shelter for your livestock and pastures. Uh, plantings will improve the condition of stock and pastoral productivity and will also provide some um, income stream for your property. Um, eligible plantings under the 2014 uh, environmental plantings method. Uh, and plantings uh, under the 2014 method must be uh, plantings um, comprising of a mixture of trees and shrubs that are native to your local area similar composition and structure and established through planting, tube stock or direct seedling. And plantings that are able to achieve forest cover. Uh, forest cover 
undeveloped method means uh, that plantings can grow over two meters in height and can cover at least 20% of your project area. And plantings that have forest potential within 12 months of, um, of your planting. Um, simply meaning the plantings are not failing after 12 months. Uh, let's have a look at eligible projects under the method. There are a number of things that your project can't involve. For example, you should not have forest um, on your property five years before your project start date. Um, you can't plant um, landscape plantings. Uh, you can't plant on land that already contains woody vegetation. Uh, and the project can't involve planting a known wheat species. Also, you can't have clearing of native vegetation seven years before the project start date. Um, uh, let's talk about the new method. Uh, they are currently with the Department of Climate Change, uh, the Environment and Water. The our current 2014 method is going to expire, or as we call it, sunset on 1st of October 2024. So no new projects can be declared under the 2014 method or, or after this date, 1st of October 2024. Projects de declared under the method prior to method sunset may continue but you won't be able uh, to add new, any new areas to your already registered project. Uh, so the crediting start date, meaning your start date when you can claim credits uh, of already registered project of existing projects must be before the method sunset date, meaning before the 1st of October 2024. A replacement method uh, is going currently going through um, public consultation, and it's open until uh, until Monday, fifteenth of July. And please, please, if you've got some time, have a look at the uh, proposed draft. Uh, so the department is planning to include a few um, a few changes. We really hope they will be better compared to the old method. For example. Under the new method, proponents now uh, can own seeds and seedlings before applying to register a project and can prepare the land for planting uh, between applying to register and the project registration. Uh, mixed species environmental plantings may include climate resilient native uh, species, not part of the local vegetation, provided the species are appropriate for the local area. Uh, and for projects using a specific full chem calibration, fertilizer use is allowed during the first 12 months of the planting. Um, we really hope again that the new method will be better. And if you don't have time now to apply under the old method, we, we're suggesting you to apply under the new method. And yeah, consultation open until Monday. If you've got some time, please have a look at the uh, DQ website. Um, this is uh, consult.dq.gov.au. Um, all right, that is all uh, over to you, Gabby, to go through online services and project registration form. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Elena. I'll just pop up uh, the online services instance that I have open here. Okay, so online services is the tool that you'll be using to submit, uh, prepare and submit a registration under the Reforestation Environmental Mallee Plantings 2014 uh, method. I imagine when the 2024 method uh, is enacted, it'll be using the same tool. I might go through the general process for a registration and just highlight some areas that you may find interesting. First off, let's pop in pilot into our search bar and we're selecting the register a project uh, square here. Once we select that, it will take a little while to load up the relevant form. Now the form is split into a number of different sections. It'll come up eventually. 
Uh, those sections are your project proponents, so information about who's running the project, project details, information more uh, broadly, I'd say, about the project, project area, we're looking for geospatial data and other information here, project activities, information to confirm that your project is in line with what's required in the method, and then finally some signatory and declaration aspects um, that are largely administrative. We'll have a look on the Before You Start page. It'll take you through some information about participating in the scheme, uh, provide some very useful links uh, through to uh, legal right, eligible interest holders, permanence periods, these kinds of things. We do have a page specifically as well on the environmental plantings pilot. If you do get a chance, this is a, uh, this is a very good page that provides some information on uh, eligibility, uh, excluded activities, and the requirements of the method uh, in terms of project activities, uh, reporting, uh, audits, these kinds of things as well. I will flag as well that there is an information pack for the environmental plantings pilot that's 19 pages long. Um, this is a, a bit of a one-stop uh, shop for the, uh, for the pilot. It'll take you through uh, a bit of the life cycle of a pilot project and some other requirements that they are. I might just pop back into the application form. The rest of this is just checking that you're acting as the right person within client portal. If you created an individual account, it'll come up with your name uh, in this section. In the project proponents page, you'll be asked to provide details about the proponent for the project. And if you haven't already, you'll need to register either as an individual or as an organization to participate under the ACU scheme. Now there is a fit and proper persons test involved in that, uh, which is essentially uh, determining uh, whether or not that individual or organization uh, is fit uh, to participate in the scheme. There is some additional information that's required for that, um, but there's a good amount of documentation of that online that you can read through. Um, something I will flag as well, if you do have any questions about the scheme uh, or specifically about our methods, uh, more than happy to take questions or queries. There is a question a little bit further down about whether or not the project has an agent. Now, the projects, as it says in our help section, do not need to have an agent, but you may choose to have one. Uh, that may be a carbon services provider, uh, where information about carbon services providers can be found on the Carbon Market Institute's uh, Marketplace page. Uh, there's an exhaustive list there of people and organisations uh, who uh, can uh, provide services in preparing an application and preparing off, pardon me, preparing offsets reports, these kinds of things. You'll be asked about your skills and experience to carry out the project. Now in this, you might want to talk about any uh, land management experience uh, that you have or any formal education. Either way, we're looking to see whether or not the participant has the required skills and experience to carry out an active scheme project. Obviously, that's quite multifaceted. Uh, that includes uh, the ability to actually undertake the plantings, uh, as well as the ability to plan a plan project, uh, undertake some basic carbon modelling, these kinds of things. The fit and proper person's eligibility here uh, speaks to the, uh, well, the the proper status of the project proponent. Um, simple question about whether or not there's any activities uh, that the project proponent may have undertaken that could uh, affect their ability to pass a fit and proper person's test. Most cases that won't be the case. However, there is, if you select yes, it'll open up a drop down with a number of different items. In the project details page, you'll be asked to nominate a name for the project. We're looking for one that's nice and simple that uh, sums up what the project is. Uh, you could uh, go uh, uh, Hillview Environmental Plantings Project or something along those lines, perhaps your farm name or another piece of information there. And then a little section to describe the project in simple language, so it's just explaining what it is that you're doing within the project, uh, i.e. planting a, a grove of mixed species environmental plantings on my land for ecological benefits or something along those lines is quite suitable. Project start date, now this is for the start date of the crediting period. As Elena said earlier, that does need to be on or before the sunset date of the method. If you're applying under the 2014 method, ideally that would be the 30th of September this year. Uh, that makes it nice and clear that that is before the sunset date. 
You'll be asked about the newness, additionality and government programs requirements. Now these are general eligibility criteria under the method. The newness requirement is that activities have not already commenced for the project. They can't commence prior to declaration. Um, there may be some changes to this potentially in the 2024 version of the method. However, for now, uh, certainly is uh, very important for the method. And we do have some guidance on that available on our website in terms of what does or does not constitute a potential breach of newness. When we're looking at regulatory additionality, we're looking at whether or not the activities in the project are required to be undertaken by law. If, for instance, uh, an order has been issued to revegetate a certain area of land, uh, if, for instance, an order has been made to rehabilitate a certain area of land, uh, the project may not meet regulatory, uh, regulatory additionality requirements. Just something to consider there. And again, we've got some good guidance on that on our website. Now, activities or funding under specified government programs, the only specified government program applicable to this is the 20 million trees program. Um, if your project was funded under that, that may not be eligible. However, uh, uh, that program did close quite a while ago. In terms of regulatory approvals, you will be asked whether or not the project requires any regulatory approvals. Now, again, this can refer to Commonwealth, state, territory, or local government approvals. Generally speaking, uh, for New South Wales, that will either be local government development applications that are required. Uh, they may be uh, different in terms of different uh, LGAs. Uh, there is also a New South Wales plantation authorization uh, requirement through the New South Wales DPI that may be required for your project. So certainly do reach out to them. And I believe Nick uh, may have some wisdom to offer on that uh, later on. Uh, finally, in this section, you'll be asked about a forward abatement estimate for your project. Now, a forward abatement estimate is essentially how much carbon you expect to be sequestered as a result of that project. Uh, you can calculate this using a variety of different tools. You could either use FullCam, uh, which is slightly more complex, or there is a lovely tool developed by CSIRO, uh, which is Luxi. Uh, in this tool, you can plot out an area of land, answer a few questions, and it will uh, spit out a potential FAE uh, for that project, uh, which is, yeah, a lovely tool to use there. And you can use that uh, in generating your FAE. Hopping back into the form, in your project area, you'll be asked to provide some spatial files about your project. Now, in this, we're looking for a map indicating the project area. Now you can complete this mapping using a geospatial tool such as ArcGIS Pro, or QGIS is I believe a free and open source tool, or even Google Earth Pro, uh, you can generate a polygon in and provide that to us through this application. You'll be asked in here as well about your project area details. Now in this, we're looking for details about the land where the project is being conducted on. Uh, I, uh, providing your state or territory, your lot and plan number, and a few other details there about the LGA, uh, your NRM region, which uh, may be your riverine or local land services, uh, and some details about your legal right type. Within that, you uh, will be providing some supporting documents for legal right. Nine out of 10 cases, that will just be providing land titles for the land where the project is being implemented on. However, uh, if there is, if the land is in ownership of two people and only one person is applying, legal right and may need to be provided to the participant from that other person. Similarly, you'll be asked whether or not your project is consistent with the NRM plan for your region. Uh, you should be able to find that on your local land services website. There's some other information uh, to be provided as well, including native title and land rights, whether or not there's native title or uh, any indigenous land use agreements over that area. A good tool to use for that is native title vision. Native title vision now, uh, enables you to have a look at a specified area and see whether or not there are any uh, native title claims or uh, allures over that specified area. It's taking a moment to load up. Um, but when it does, it'll load up with a, a map of the area and display that uh, data visually. I'll pop back into the application form. Eligible interest holders are certainly a, an element of the ACU scheme. An eligible interest holder, for instance, could be if your land is under a mortgage. Uh, the mortgager would be considered to be an eligible interest holder. 
Um, similarly, um, if the land has a, a lease on a certain area of it, or if there's uh, any other essentially registered interest on the title, um, they may constitute an eligible interest holder. An eligible interest holder consent may be required. There is a form available for that, which is linked uh, just in the application form as well. Something I will note is that projects can be registered conditionally on eligible interest holder consent and uh, regulatory approvals. Uh, if that's the case, then they are to be uh, provided to the regulator by the end of the first reporting period for the project. So that can enable projects to be declared uh, on the condition that either regulatory approvals and or eligible interest holder consent is provided before the end of that first reporting period. I'll head down a little bit further. You'll be asking questions about excluded offsets projects, adverse impacts on vegetation and complementary schemes and programs. You will be asked to nominate a permanence period for your project. So how long that, uh, how long that planting will be uh, permanent for, protected for on that land, either 25 or 100 years. If you nominate a 25 year permanence period, uh, the project will be subject to a 20% reduction in the number of ACUs that will be issued to that project, which is something to bear in mind in terms of uh, how many ACUs uh, can be issued to that project going forward. Uh, you can move from a 25 year to a 100 year permanence period, but you cannot move from a 100 year to a 25 year permanence period is just something to note there. You uh, should be providing a permanence plan. We do have a permanence plan uh, template which is available for our REMP pilot projects, um, which is quite nice. It steps out what uh, enables you to identify what are the uh, risks facing permanence uh, to that, i.e. fire, pest damage, these kinds of things. And then uh, you'll be identifying, well, okay, what are the controls that are gonna be put in place to address those potential risks? Heading along to the final section we'll be having a look at today is the project activities section of the application form. It is just loading up, there we go. Um, in this, you're confirming that your project meets the requirements of the environmental plantings pilot, i.e. that it's covered under the 2014 ramp method, that it will be modelled as a mixed species block planting using the generic calibration in full cam, that the total uh, carbon estimation areas for the project will be no more than 200 hectares, and the project proponent is a freehold title holder, leaseholder or native title holder for the project area. They're the main uh, specific eligibility requirements for the environmental plantings pilot. Similarly, in this section, you're asked to confirm that your project will meet the requirements of the method. Uh, that is that the planting is a mixture of tree and shrub species that are native to the local area. A few others about where the seeds are sourced from and that the planting mix reflects the structure and composition of the local vegetation community. Heading down, you'll be asked to provide a bit of a description of uh, what species you're planting, how those species are native to the local area, and some details about the planting density. This is to demonstrate eligibility under the method. You'll be asked again about the planting area size and asked to upload any additional information that you may have to demonstrate that the application meets requirements under the method. That could be a, a species list for the project. Uh, that also could be uh, any additional files that you think may be relevant to your application and enable the CR to assess that. That has been a bit of an overview, albeit a quick one, of the REMP uh, pilot application form. We might address questions at the end, Patrick. I appreciate your questions, um, but we'll have a chat there. And for now, I will hand over to Nick. Cheers, thank you. Um, Nick Myers, my name, I'm the manager for the um, plantations unit, authorization and audit team. So we've got five people across the state who have uh, been administering the Plantations and Reforestations Act since 2001. Um, under the Act, we authorise timber and environmental plantings. Um, and the most relevant section, I won't run through the whole legislation bit, but uh, in a nutshell, you need authorisation if you're going to plant or establish more than 30 hectares in New South Wales. That's for timber or environmental plantings. Um, under 30 hectares, you fall into a category of the Act called Exempt Farm Forestry. That also exempts you from the EP&A Act, so you don't have to go and see the local government if you um, are under the 30 hectares. 
provided you're in the correct zoning, which is basically anything except township or, or residential type things. Um, uh, currently, there's there's no fee for uh, plantation authorizations. There has been in the past, but after the 2019 bushfires, uh, the fee was waived for five years. So we're coming up to a period where there may be a fee introduced for for plantings over 30 hectares. Um, our basic uh, assessment um, criteria is uh, in accordance with the code, which is the regulation under the Act. So we look into things like um, soil and water protection. So if you're establishing close to drainage features, rivers, uh, drainage lines or creeks, whatever, there's categories under the Act there. Um, we also uh, do a uh, um, a, bi a biodiversity assessment. So there's some categories in the code that uh, relate to sort of establishment methods on steep or um, um, also excludes areas such as rocky outcrops and um, <clears throat> uh, high conservation grasslands and, and things like that. But in a, in a rural landscape, those things rarely sort of figure in the scheme of things. Um, and there's also a cultural heritage assessment that we do at the same time. So it involves an AHIM search and, and um, then we can um, buffer the any sites that may happen to occur on the, in, within the planting area. Um, yeah, it also involves a site visit as well. So we have to, uh, it's legislated that an officer has to visit the site and, and look at those things and um, um, yeah, just check compliance with the activity, with the code of practice. Um, that's sort of it in a nutshell. I mean, the, the legislation covers everything from a, you know, a small environmental planting right up to a large commercial timber plantation with roading and harvesting and, and all those sorts of activities. Um, but of course, in, in most sort of environmental plantings, those those activities don't generally occur um, but uh, I just I'll put their website address in the chat um, there's a lot of information there people can go and, and look uh, all our contact details are there for the officers involved in the assessments and um, yeah feel free to contact although if we're if we're just doing Murray um, Murrumbidgee sort of catchments that, that's probably me but uh, all that information's there on the website. If you um, if you care to have a look and reach out, if you have any further questions. Thank you, Alina, Gabriel, and Nick for your presentations. I'll now open up the the Q and A session because I'm sure uh, those presentations have maybe raised quite a few questions, and also Kate has come across quite a few when she's been doing the site visits. So I'll, um, if anyone has questions, they're welcome to come off mute and ask them. But we probably might just kick off with the questions that um, Patrick has put in the chat. So Patrick, do you want to just come off mute and re-ask re those questions and we'll go from there? Okie dokie. Um, so my first question was just regarding the proponents. Part of it was it enough that only one person did that? Like, if there were multiple legal owners of a property, are they each meant to register as an individual? Proponent? And then, if you don't, I mean, the trust is to register as a proponent as well. Okay, I think um, that question was we, we couldn't really fully grasp that. With what you said, but I think it was through through the chat there. So, is that a question for Alina or Gabriel to answer? Yeah, certainly I can jump on that one. And uh, Patrick, I've put answers in the chat for both of your questions there as well. Um, essentially, every landowner on a title. Um, so, if you obviously have a have a title that's owned by multiple people, uh, they're not required to all be the uh, be project participants. Um, that being said, if only one of, say, uh, two uh, landowners on a title 
um, were the project participant. Um, then the other, who is not the participant, would have to provide legal right to the one who is. Uh, there's some additional information there as well in terms of if there's a nominee. Uh, there, in, there would be a nominee, for instance, uh, where there are multiple participants in a project. Uh, one of those has to be the nominee. Uh, that person uh, would be the one, for instance, who receives uh, accused generated uh, through the project. Um, if we have a trust, for instance, that's looking to be uh, a project participant, uh, at the end of the, we'd be looking to have that be a, a trustee for the trust um, at the end of the day, uh, given the, the complex uh, legal structure of trusts uh, in and of themselves. Right. So in that case, our a project participant would be um, uh, XYZ Proprietary Limited as trustee for the ABC Trust. Okay. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, is there anybody else who has any questions uh, as a result of what they've heard this morning or, their, um, or where they're at with their presentation so far? Um, I had a quick question just about the DPI. Um, does that have to happen before the CER, like, um, information to, or can that happen after you've been approved? Is it the plantation authorisation you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Um, you should have a an authorisation before you do any ground ground prep, spraying, ripping, anything like that. So um, we've noticed in in multiple cases this year that there's a lot of works being undertaken without authorisation. So over the thirty hectare mark. Um, so I think I believe our executive wrote to the CEO to to inform them of that uh, requirement in New South Wales, but yeah, to comply with the law, you need to to get your authorisation. Um, I'm not sure how the CEO would, you know, you you need to have that before you we commence any sort of works. I guess is, is yep. at the end of the day. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And just another one, with the species list um, in the CER um, that we have not confirmed that, so can that just be an estimate? Gabriel? Yeah, so we can, yeah, thanks Ruby. Um, so we can certainly appreciate that uh, when you're preparing your application, you may not have a full understanding of, uh, you know, the exact species that will be planted in the ground. Um, Ideally, the species list provided through to us will be as accurate as possible, um, but we do understand that there is room to change. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the, the proponent needs to ensure that they're not going to be planting any uh, known weed species uh, is the main requirement there. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, are, are there any other questions that people have? If not, whilst people are trying to um, maybe come up with some mini questions. We might go over, um, introduce Kate. So she's the project officer for Living Carbon in Riverina. And um, she's come up with a list of some of the questions that have been raised with the discussions we've had so far with landholders. So Kate, did you want to ask some of those questions now to our speakers? Yep. Yeah, thanks, Shereen. I've just got a few now. A lot of them have been answered throughout this. So that's great. Thank you, everybody. Um, so for the CER, um, obviously this is in relation to um, a separate grant program. So we have um, some landholders participating who will potentially not go through with their projects if they happen to be unsuccessful with the grant. Um, is it possible for them to revoke their project after it's been registered or not go through with it in this situation? Gabrielle, did you want to try and answer that one or Alina? Um, just briefly, my apologies, I just had a bit of an audio thing. Would you mind repeating the question there, please? Yeah, so it's just whether um, a project can be revoked or if they can not, not go through with it basically after it's been registered, just because some of them will be relying on the grant funding and they won't know if they're successful until after they've registered with the CER. Yeah, that's definitely fair enough. Uh, projects can be voluntarily revoked. Um, uh, there is a form available for that. If you just search up voluntary revocation, uh, clean energy regulator, 
It should be on the very bottom of that page. Uh, but yes, there is a form available for that that gets filled out and then uh, emailed through to the CER. That's great, thank you. Um, for any of the people that might have already registered their projects under the current 2014 method um, and had their declaration or their crediting start date um, prior to the, the sunset, um, if they did want to transfer into the new method once it's available, how do they do that? So yeah, it will be possible to vary uh, the project from the old method to the new method 2024 through uh, variation to the method. It's very pretty much very, very simple process. Okay, so just an online mm -hmm. form or something. Yeah, okay, correct. Um, a question for Nick. Um, with the plantations authorization, if a person is doing um, planning on planting multiple distinct areas, um, which are individually less than 30 hectares, um, but in total on the property add up to more than 30 hectares, they still need an authorization? Yeah, that's correct. It's 30 hectares on any sort of one land holding. Okay. Yep. yep. Thank you. And the only other one was a, a bit about the relevant skills and experience um, with the CER, some of the proof that's needed for that. I think that um, there might be an answer to that in the chat um, from Patrick's question, but I guess it was just about what sort of documents um, you, a landholder could provide to prove competency or relevant skills and experience if they don't necessarily have the formal qualification. Um, I guess if they're working with us, they can put our some of our information down um, as support. Um, what other information might they provide? Yeah, certainly. Uh, in that instance, it's great uh, to uh, put in statements about, again, uh, your your land management experience. Um, if you generally do run livestock and uh, as a result of the planting you'll need to exclude livestock from that planting area for the first uh, little while until that until those trees are mature enough essentially that there's not going to be any uh, damage um, including information potentially about your uh, your livestock management experience there may also be useful uh, that can just be in the form of statements um, uh, certainly indicating that you are running the project uh, you know and you have uh, support or you have, you're engaging with local land services is certainly beneficial. Um, it indicates uh, you're uh, accessing a, a good amount of expertise, uh, not only in land management, in terms of uh, carbon projects as well. Thank you. I think there's been a couple more questions in the chat. Um, one from Kylie in regards to Patrick's question about trusts. If registered in the name of the trustee company, I assume it would be directors that assume legal right for the project. So it comes down to who the participant uh, is for that project. So if the participant is, um, as I said before, XYZ Proprietary Limited as trustee for the ABC Trust, um, then yes, it would be uh, the the responsible persons of XYZ Proprietary Limited uh, there who would ultimately bear uh, bear that responsibility, uh, just in line with uh, how your corporation is established. Mm -hmm. And there's a follow up question from Virginia: Is an eligible interest holder the joint owner of the land? who is not the proponent, i.e. need to do a consent form? Yeah, fantastic question. It's very similar to, I think, a question that, uh, yes, Virginia put in the Q&A uh, section of uh, this as well. Um, yes, so if we have a uh, land holding that has uh, John Doe and Jane Doe potentially as the landholders, if John Doe is uh, the project proponent, um, then John Doe will need to obtain legal right and eligible interest holder consent uh, from Jane Doe. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, right. the legal right needs to be provided before uh, the project is declared. Um, however, uh, as I uh, said previously, uh, projects can be declared conditional on eligible interest holder consent. 
That being said, if it's simple to obtain both at the same time before declaration, it will uh, minimize the amount of uh, administration to do with the project later on. Thanks, Gabriel. Do you mind just telling me where you want that sent? You just email it, do you, the consent form? Yeah, sure. Um, so when we're coming in terms of eligible and child consent, if you're preparing an application, there should be a section in that application to provide uh, any eligible and child consent I've, forms I've that have been consent. completed. Yeah, I've got the consent form and I've had it signed now that it's back from traipsing around overseas. Um, yep. So where do you want that sent? Um, fantastic. Do you have a project currently under consideration with the CER? Yes. Yes, so okay, then sure. I need to understand how to attach it to that, if you know what I mean, once you've registered, once you've sent it in. Yeah, not a problem. I'm going to paste an email address into the chat. Uh, so this what, is the... What number do you want? Because you get a few different numbers coming back at you. Which, what will it have? The CER, the one that's for the project registration? Because I get I got very confused in the beginning, but that's not unusual with all the IT problems and things. There's an individual registration form as well. And I think it was yourself I spoke to very early on and you said, well, really, you meant to have done that before you register for the environmental planting pilot. Is that your preference that we do the one first? So there should be an option to register as an individual or as an organisation within the application form. Uh, now, if that is completed that way, uh, both yeah. forms will be submitted essentially to the CER at the same time. Um, yeah. If a registering individual or organisation is completed, is submitted prior to uh, prior to uh, commencing our submitting application for a project, uh, okay. that can cause some delays. Yes. Um, in terms of your eligible and consent form, yep, if you'd be able to send it through to the email address that popped in the chat, that would be okay. fantastic. Okay. Um, for everyone as well, um, the email address in the chat is for our section. If you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to send it through to that email address as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Kate, did we have any other any other questions that haven't been answered so far like, like from the, that list that you had? Um, I'm pretty sure everything's been covered either in the Q&A or through the presentations. Thanks, Sherry. Okay. Actually, Alina, I had a question for you. I think it, early on in you were saying that our landscape plantings were not eligible. Oh. Could, could, yeah. Can you explain what do you mean by landscape plantings? Uh, so we've got a definition of landscape planting uh, in the method. Uh, I'm going to open the method right now. I've just popped that in the chat there, Elena. Oh, thank you, Katie. Oh, yes, perfect. Uh, awesome, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And just finally, so with this new method coming on board, when do you think land... <laughs> So at this stage, landholders can complete their sort of, they can register as an applicant, start that process. But then when will this new method, do you think, will become available and they can then finalise their application? So we don't have any, <laughs> any dates when the new method will be released, unfortunately. Okay. Mm. No Will it be, um, when does this mm -hmm. grant opportunity close? Oh, good question, 5th of December. We, we have an initial date of, of December and that's because when you, put, when you, when you set up these grants um, in the Smarty Grant, you do have to have a closing date, but it is sort of from the... Um, the PIPAP program, they will be um, assessed um, as in first in, first served. So we are expecting that that date will be extended. I don't know if there's anyone from the PIPAP program on the webinar today that would like to add to that response. Uh, yeah, Please? this is Amit. I'll just jump in very quickly. Um, we obviously can't promise an extension, um, an extension to the grant will need to be justified and so that's obviously something we would have to put through uh, closer to that closing date 
with whatever justification we have, which could be the fact that the new method hasn't sort of come online um, at the time that we expected. But obviously at this stage in time, we can't say, we can't guarantee that it will be extended. That's sort of out, out of our hands. It needs to go through an approval process. Thanks for that, Lamise. All right. Are there any other questions? Um, if you do, if you if you come up with some questions after the webinars um, finish, feel free to either put them in the chat or send them through to Kate, and we will get them answered by one of our speakers today. But um, before we wrap up, Kate, you had just a few key messages you wanted to leave with everybody. Yeah, thanks, Shuri. Um, basically just that anyone who's thinking of applying for living carbon, as you'll be aware, um, needs to register their, their project uh, with the ACCI scheme, with the CER. So um, some of you may have already submitted a registration under the, the current 2014 method. So you might want to think about um, if you want to vary your project and transfer to the new method once it becomes available. For others who are waiting for the, the 2024 method to become available, um, there are you know, potentially still some things you can be working on now to get your documents and, and information ready um, so that you're right to go when that does become available. Um, and yeah, make sure that you reach out to myself or, or to Shree, um, and we can try and help you with some of that. So things like um, the mapping or helping with your forward abatement estimate calculation and things um, as part of the Living Carbon program, that's what we're there to help with. So make sure you reach out throughout that process. Um, Thank you to, to Gabriel for putting that email in the, the chat. It's also a good way to try and get some information from the CER. Um, that was probably the main things. Thanks, Sheree. Thanks, Kate. Well, finally, I'd like to extend my appreciation to our speakers and also to thank you um, for attending today's webinar. As we've mentioned, it, it has been recorded and Kate will send out the link so you can refer to it in the future. Please get in touch with us if you're interested in applying for this project so that we can start to help you on your on, on your journey and, and we can also keep you up to date as to when the new method becomes available. And, um, yeah, and finally, if you've got any questions, um, please send them through to Kate or myself. Okay, thank you very much for your time, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.